In 1977, Ron Wyatt made his first trip to this area. It was during this first trip that Ron found numerous huge drogue-style anchor stones, all the same approximate size as the one here. These were all in a direct alignment with the boat-shaped object, evidencing their being cut loose or dropped as the Ark entered the area of its final rest. These bear ancient iconographic inscriptions of the eight survivors of the flood. In December of 1978, an earthquake in this highly remote area dropped the soil from around the formation, allowing Ron to see for the first time the rib timbers and deck support timbers visibly exposed on the sides. A large crack was also formed along the entire length of the object, and he was able to measure the depth and take samples for analysis. The analyses showed a very high organic carbon content consistent with ancient wood. Later metal detection surveys and subsurface interface radar showed an incredible man-made structure encapsulated within the formation. Keels and keelsums, bulkheads, decks, and even partitions between the cages became visible through these scientific devices. That's the seductive beauty that brings them here, Snowcap Mount Ararat. The explorers looked for the ark there since that's the highest point around here. And as the flood waters receded, presumably that's where it would have landed. But the Bible describes the mountains of Ararat, mountains, plural. Is it possible that the ark came to rest on one of the smaller sister mountains to Ararat? Have you ever seen anything like this? Look at the grain in this thing. It almost looks like wood. But now there are fundamentalists who are contradicting that claim. They are the new believers. Ron Wyatt and Dave Fassel believe they have found the ark on a slope of what the local people call Doomsday Mountain some 15 miles south of Mount Ararat. It's apparently old Armenian tombstones that commemorate the survival of Noah and his family. They had a strange stone. When the early Christians found these crosses, found these things, they carved eight crosses on there for the eight survivors. This whole valley was known of as the region of eight. Ron, what's the significance of the placement of the crosses in these stones? All right, uh, Tom, this is an iconographic representation here of a man, the head of the household, his wife, his three sons, and his three daughters or daughters-in-law. And as you can see here, the eight crosses, the ones to his left are the lady folks in the family. The ones to his right are the men folks in the family. Do these fit the, uh, the story of Noah? Uh, they do. To Wyatt and Fassel, these stones appear to be in direct alignment to the boat-shaped site on Doomsday Mountain. The Doomsday Mountain team brought in some high technology to explore the oldest legend of man. They began scanning their site with a molecular frequency generator. It's a device used by surgeons to pinpoint cancer tumors, and it's been used by Fassel to locate underwater treasure. This time, the molecular frequency generator began to pick up a unique pattern of iron lines beneath the earth. Okay, bring that one up. They began placing ribbons along those lines. The finished shape outlined by the ribbons was that of a huge ship, the approximate length and width of Noah's Ark, as described in the Bible. The fascinating field of ribbons soon attracted higher academic interest. Hey, that looks like iron. Okay. Dr. John Baumgartner, a physicist with Los Alamos Laboratories, sent samples back to the lab for analysis and confirmed that the metal they were tracing with the ribbons was indeed iron. With the width and the length known, the only remaining question was depth. By locating the depth of the hull, they could determine if the boat-shaped object had the cargo capacity described in the biblical ark. To resolve this final issue, Wyatt and Fassel brought geologist Tom Finner to Turkey with his company's heavy-duty subsurface radar equipment. There is something beneath that rock, besides rock. A radar device developed by Geophysical Survey Systems in Hudson was used on the mountain. The device called SIR is used by energy exploration companies to analyze what's below the Earth's surface. According to SIR, something man-made is under Mount Arida. This data is not it does not represent natural geology. It's, it's a man-made structure. These reflections are occurring very per periodic, too periodic to be random nat natural type interfaces. The governor of Ari had Ron demonstrate the radar. When he found what looked like a broken timber near the surface, 
the governor had it dug up and gave it to Ron to be verified. The lab test revealed organic carbon. It was petrified wood. But the final proof was when it was sectioned. The evidence was obvious. Not only could the internal wood structure be seen, it was also clearly laminated wood. Three separate layers could be seen. The adhesive material or glue had seeped out and hardened on one end and was perfectly aligned with the internal layers. On our last trip out there this past June, we found this very impressive rivet. And if you'll notice here, the plate itself is just a little more than a quarter of an inch in thickness. It's approximately three and a half inches in diameter, the plate itself, and then the shaft of the rivet is roughly an inch to an inch and a quarter in diameter. And if you'll notice here, it was struck while it was hot and flared out the end of the shaft so that it would not slide back through the hole in this washer. And this uh, shows that their abilities to use metal uh, was quite advanced, uh, quite sophisticated, and uh, folks, there are thousands of these rivets on this boat. In fact, at every joint where the wooden structures are held together, they're held together by large metal plates, which are predominantly iron, and then these rivets. Uh, good morning. I was just wondering how the size of the structure compared with the uh, dimensions in the Bible. Okay, uh, Moses was educated in Egypt, we're told that in the New Testament and also in the Old Testament, and the uh, royal Egyptian cubit, which he was familiar with and we believe used in the giving the dimensions of the ark, is 20.6 inches, and 300 of those is exactly uh, 515 feet, and uh, that is the dim length dimension of the boat. The boat has splayed some, uh, and this is to be expected in an aging boat. So the width is a little greater than that specified in the Bible, but you figure the degree of splaying and you come up with very close uh, measurements, uh, very similar to those in the Bible. Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain. In Genesis 19, we read how these cities were destroyed by God with brimstone and fire from heaven the first biblical record of God's vengeance upon evil since the Great Flood. After driving past these at least 30 or 40 times in the past 12 years, this time they suddenly looked like the shapes of city walls and buildings. Pulling over, he and his crew closely examined these desolate areas. Taking samples of the material, they discovered that they broke right off in their hand and disintegrated into dust the consistency of talcum powder as Greg Brewer shows us here. Following what clearly looked like the shape of an outer wall, we soon met with a most breathtaking sight. And along these streets were the shapes of buildings. Even to our untrained eye, the evidence was undeniable. The ziggurat shape near the entrance was almost perfectly preserved. Our research had yielded the fascinating fact that substances burned with sulfur or brimstone had a remaining ash that was heavier than the initial unburned substance. That explained our question as to why the ash of these cities had been able to remain all these 3,900 years. The layering present in all the formations was another positive evidence that whatever these once were, they had been burned at temperatures exceeding four or 5,000 degrees. This layering effect was the result of thermal ionization. Whenever a substance is burned at extremely high temperatures, the ions of the various substances being burned attract and repel 
distorting the flame. And soon we all decided that we should go to the top of Masada and film these areas from there. The view was breathtaking. The shape of the city was perfectly revealed below us. Here we saw a giant platform-like area, perfectly symmetrical, which was identical to the temple areas of other ancient cities, such as the biblical Shushan, or Susa, located in present-day Iran. Then we saw the raised section, which we had climbed upon earlier, with the sphinx shape and the ziggurat. We were all convinced, but we also knew there had to be more evidence than this to convince others. Now the Bible tells us that it rained fire and brimstone on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now what you see in front of you here is the results of large and small, well varying sized uh, chunks of sulfur, burning sulfur that have hit. And what we find here is that God rained this burning sulfur down upon this city and rain is a perfect description of it. It landed uh, just in the pattern that rain would fall and the stuff, of course, the accumulative heat of all of this upon the city set the entire thing ablaze. The uh, flashpoint of every material there, metal, stone, of course the people, and everything burned. And this sulfur continued to burn and it vitrified the material around it after it had uh, burned it all up, sealed itself off from the oxygen and then, of course, smothered itself out. And in each of these little crystalline capsules here is a varying size chunk of sulfur. And there are millions of these in these ashes that we have here. Now, some of them we have cracked open so you can see the sulfur inside, and others we have left intact but there are millions of these here. So this shows that God indeed rained fire and brimstone upon these cities. And if you'll look in your dictionary under brimstone, you'll find that it is sulfur. As soon as he got home from that trip, Ron took several of the samples to Galbraith Labs near Knoxville, Tennessee. The yellow balls in the center of the reddish rings proved to be 95.72% sulfur, with traces of several other elements, all of which he was told would contribute to an extremely high temperature fire. When Ron asked them if they could perform a BTU test to determine the degree of heat this would give off, he was told that they couldn't because it would damage their stainless steel testing chamber. The material surrounding the encapsulated sulfur was also tested and proved to be ash. At home, we did our own small test and burned some of the sulfur in a spoon. The purplish flame is indicative of the intense heat which prohibited our holding the spoon as it burned. We later discovered our spoon had holes in it from the fire. Then, we placed a small piece of the outer material also in the spoon and attempted to burn it. But it wouldn't burn at all. It didn't even darken. It was already completely consumed by fire and nothing was left to ignite. December of 1978, an earthquake in this highly remote area dropped the soil from around the formation allowing Ron to see for the first time the rib timbers and deck support timbers were visibly exposed on the sides. A large crack was also formed along the entire length of the object. These were all in a direct alignment with the boat-shaped object, evidencing their being cut loose or dropped as the ark entered the area of its final rest. 
These bear ancient iconographic inscriptions of the eight survivors of the flood. And he was able to measure the depth and take samples for analysis. The analyses showed a very high organic carbon content consistent with ancient wood. Later metal detection surveys and subsurface interface radar showed an incredible man-made structure encapsulated with In 1977, Ron Wyatt made his first trip to this area. It was during this first trip that Ron found numerous huge drogue-style anchor stones, all the same approximate size as the one here. Then the formation. Keels and keelsums, bulkheads, decks, and even partitions between the cages became visible through these scientific devices. That's the seductive beauty that brings them here, Snowcap Mount Ararat. The explorers look for the ark there since that's the highest point around here. And as the